Hi, it's Dwyer, gamblersadvisory.com, a free site, bettingangle.us, a free site. Today is Monday, March the 2nd, 2020. Let's talk boxing, but first remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now I see, of course, the gardener outside has waited until I started this video to boot up his machine, right? Um, just dropped my four-year-old off at daycare. Have a court hearing this afternoon in a few hours. Let's let off some steam. Let's talk heavyweight boxing. Now first let me say it feels good to say it. Heavyweight boxing. Folks, the division is back and it's back big. I'm shocked, absolutely astonished that Deontay Wilder and Tyson Fury are going to hop back in the ring again in July. The quick turnaround clearly favors Fury. Clearly favors Fury. Let's talk about why. First, <clears throat> during the second fight, you notice blood streaming out of Deontay Wilder's ear. Now, Wilder wasn't moving well. I can tell you some people who I touched base with on the fight thought that perhaps Wilder had a busted eardrum, that Wilder's equilibrium was messed up by an ear injury. Right? That would have explained the bad movement. But Wilder has come out and Wilder has said, no, you know, that was just a superficial wound. My ear had no structural damage. Well, let me just tell you, that's awful news for him. That's awful news for him. He's moving around looking completely uncoordinated. Looking like he's getting bullied around the ring and can't keep up, didn't have the dexterity, didn't have the coordination of his six foot nine inch opponent. Now if you're gonna tell me that that wasn't caused by a busted eardrum, that that wasn't caused by some defect to the balancing mechanism in his ear, then wow, what am I supposed to believe? That Wilder is gonna correct the gap, and it's a sizable gap, in coordination and movement in what? Four months? Folks, it's already March. Right? Understand, they're going to do some promotional activities, as fighters always do for big fights before the fight. Then they're going to have training camps. Isn't this July fight way too soon for Deontay Wilder? to close the gaps that he has right now with Fury. Let's talk about another revelation. Wilder, unlike Mike Tyson, Tyson, one of the things that endeared him to fans was he would come in with just a towel with a hole cut out, right, and black trunks, right? The black trunks were a nod by Tyson to Jack Dempsey. Right? Tyson was old school, right? You might remember Arturo Gotti. He would come in wearing those old school satin robes. Right? Sugar Ray Robinson came in wearing some glamorous looking terry cloth robe for fights. Well, Deontay Wilder came in with an outfit that apparently weighed 40 pounds. And, of course, the ring entrances these days are grand in this post Nassim Hamed era, right? I encourage people to go back and look at Hamed's entry into the ring for a fight he lost against Marco Antonio Barrera. So Wilder's in this heavy outfit for a long period of time. Then in addition to the adrenaline, the, you know, concern, the excitement that walking into the ring for a big fight brings, here was a guy carrying 40 pounds of clothing with him into the ring. So Wilder now believes 
that it was this heavy clothing. And understand, according to reports, Wilder wears weighted vests in training. Right? He should have been accustomed to the heavy clothing because that's how he trains. But according to Wilder, this heavy clothing weighed him down and his legs were gone by the third round. Right? You know, maybe Wilder believes that. Understand, when a fighter loses, he's searching for explanations. Right? Searching for explanations. Manny Pacquiao, back in the day, once said that because he had to give blood before a fight, he felt that that weakened him during the fight and caused him to lose. Right? Fighters are looking for explanations as to why they were lethargic, why their legs didn't have the spring in them. Right? Let me offer another explanation. There's a footwork gap, and it's significant between Wilder and Fury. So understand, unlike their first fight, in this fight, Fury is constantly threatening to come inside on Wilder, right? Wilder has to repeatedly reset his legs, right? Repeatedly. Fury also is moving away from the right hand. At times, you'll notice Fury sticks his left hand out to make sure he's far enough away. So Wilder is dealing with feints. Wilder is paralyzed by movement that was different from the first fight. First fight, Fury's moving away. Wilder's the hunter. This fight, Wilder realized early on that he was actually the hunter. That Fury's actually trying to hurt him. That Fury's coming in with big right hands. I believe what stops Wilder is Fury's game plan. It's Fury's movement. Also, there's a comparative thing going on. You're Wilder, you can barely move in the ring. You're fighting a guy who's going wherever he wants to go, who's moving a lot better than you. So rather than think to yourself, because these guys are champions, right? Wilder enters the ring an unbeaten WBC champion. Rather than think to yourself, man, this guy moves a hell of a lot better than I do. <laughs> right? Rather than think about that. Rather than think about the fact that Fury's two-handed. So when Fury moves certain places, Wilder has to stop. Wilder has to think to himself, is Fury going to throw a left hook? Whereas when Wilder's moving, Fury doesn't have to stop and go as much. Because Fury doesn't have to worry about a Wilder left hook. Wilder's one-handed, right? Wilder's a straight right hand up top. Once Fury defuses that bomb, Fury doesn't have to worry about the other bombs that Wilder does. So understand, Tyson Fury beat Deontay Wilder because he's a better fighter. There's a skill gap. There's a talent gap between the two fighters, right? Understand, Wilder, this has not been as reported as it should be, came in weighing 230, which is heavy for him. One of the reasons why his legs went early is because his legs were carrying more weight than they normally do, right? Think about the lighter weight classes. If I said, hey, you know, Kovalev, you're going to carry 10 extra pounds this fight against a guy who can move. A guy with, to me, the best legs in the division. Right? Those 10 pounds are going to feel like you have 10 pound weights on you. Especially when you can't land your plan A. Your straight right hand up top. So, in the four months time between now and and the fight, right? Think about it, four months, four and a half months between today, March the 2nd, and this fight in mid-July. A fight with so much hype that the guys are entering the rings with costumes, right? That the guys are doing a lot of, you know, round table discussions, 
Hell, the fight's so big, online now they're having roundtable discussions with relatives of the fighters. Right? In a fight of this magnitude, Deontay Wilder is not going to be able to change his game enough to change the outcome of the fight. Let me also say, Wilder's been with his trainer, his group, for a long time. Fury has just hooked up, or reconnected, depending on your point of view, with Sugar Hill. Right, so here you have Fury, right, with a new trainer. Folks, they're going to take it to the next level. Fury now knows with certainty he can stop Wilder. Right? Because, let's face it, he battered Wilder so badly that Wilder's corner threw in the towel. You have Kenny Bayless now, the referee, saying he was about to stop the fight. You have Wilder going down off a body shot with Fury's offhand. Right? Fury now understands that the path to victory includes him coming inside, something he may not have realized in his third fight back when he fought Wilder the first time. So make no mistake, Tyson Fury, in my opinion, is going to win this next fight likely by stoppage again. Right? Wilder's dead on his feet in the middle of this fight. Folks, it was a 12-round fight. Right? It was scheduled for 12. Wilder's dead on his feet. How is he going to last in this fight? I don't think he is. I think the bet for the third fight is the same as the bet for the second fight. Wilder's only chance of beating Tyson Fury, quite frankly, is by KO. You want to take Fury to win? We can play around. We'll look at the odds when they're posted of the over-unders. We can play around with over-unders. But I believe the safer play here is Wilder to win, and you can hedge just to break even. Excuse me, Fury to win, you can hedge just to break even with Wilder by KO. Right? That's how I see that fight. Now, let me say this, and I don't say it lightly. Tyson Fury's unbeaten. Think about the best heavyweights of the last, oh, we'll go back. 15 years. Right? Understand that Tyson Fury has already beaten Vladimir Klitschko when Klitschko was champion. Multi-year title holder. And he's beaten Deontay Wilder when Deontay Wilder was an unbeaten champion. If he pivots after this fight and let's be real here. Fury's still unbeaten. Quite frankly, he shouldn't even have the draw. I thought he won the first fight. If Anthony Joshua beats Kubrat Pulev, and let me point out, he's going to have to be on his front foot to do so. He's going to have to come in on gaps in Kubrat Pulev's jab. He's going to have to use power. He's going to have to fight the fight that Vladimir Klitschko did against Kubrat Pulev because if he allows that fight to go to decision, there's going to be controversy. Right? You don't want fights to go to a decision when you're dealing with a guy with a superior jab who has made his career around that jab. Well, let's say Anthony Joshua destroys Kubrat Pulev and there is no controversy. If Tyson Fury fights Anthony Joshua this year, right? He fights Wilder in July. If his fight after that is against Anthony Joshua, right? Because Joshua has to realize, he has to realize that Alexander Usyk is also a dangerous opponent who doesn't bring the legacy that Tyson Fury brings. 
right? If Joshua is able to annex the lineal heavyweight championship and the WBC heavyweight title, that would be a huge accomplishment. So understand, if Tyson Fury fights Anthony Joshua in his fight after Wilder, assuming he beats Wilder, if Tyson Fury beats Anthony Joshua and becomes someone who will have beaten Vladimir Klitschko, by the way, he beats Klitschko in Germany, right? Very different than the Anthony Joshua Klitschko fight in the UK, right? Fury beats Klitschko in Klitschko's backyard. Fury then beats Wilder in Las Vegas, in Wilder's backyard. I'll agree, the fight didn't take place in Alabama, Wilder's real backyard, but the fight took place in the United States. If Tyson Fury beats Anthony Joshua after beating Deontay Wilder so that he is still unbeaten and will have beaten Vladimir Klitschko, Deontay Wilder, and Anthony Joshua, Folks, that's a Hall of Fame resume. He would never have to step in the ring again. You've had some guys in boxing history, right? Jeffries, the guy who Jack Johnson beat when Jeffries foolishly returned to the ring against a dominant champion. You've had some guys in history who have walked away at times where if they never returned, you would be talking about them as one of the best heavyweights in history, right? Understand, Jeffries was unbeaten when he meets up with Johnson on July the 4th, 1910. Understand, if Tyson Fury, who at different times has said he wants to run roughshod through the heavyweight division, but at other times has said, look, I'm looking for the off-ramp. I only want to fight a limited number of times. Understand, if the same guy beats Klitschko, Wilder, Klitschko when he's champ, Wilder when he's champion and unbeaten, and Joshua when Joshua's champ, that's a Hall of Fame career, right? The other fights, fights against people like Dylan White and stuff like that, those would be academic. The Joseph Parker possible matchup is intriguing because, unlike Dylan White, Joseph Parker actually held a share of the heavyweight title. Right? Also, I believe the Parker Joshua fight was hurt badly by the referee. You saw Andy Ruiz collapse the pocket on Joshua, knock him down four times. You saw Joseph Parker try to collapse the pocket on Joshua, only to be stopped by the referee. I believe Joseph Parker, though, because of the loss to Dylan White, right, because of the loss to Anthony Joshua, because of the fact that Parker right now doesn't have a belt, I believe Fury could avoid Parker if he wanted to retire without an outcry. Right? So make no mistake, you're looking at history here. You're looking at a champ, and I'll agree with Otto Wallen. I've said this in prior videos. I don't believe Fury would be unbeaten. If the doctor looked at that gushing cut against Otto Wallen and stopped that fight on cuts. I also agree with Steve Cunningham. Cunningham feels the end of this fight with... Fury was dirty. That Fury almost laces him, right? Fury has him over at the side of the ropes. Look at the end of the fight. He puts up... This is a fight, by the way, where Fury's on the canvas. This is the fight Fury has told reporters is the toughest fight of his career. You'll notice Fury has his hand up on Cunningham's face. Then he removes the hand and throws the knockout punch. Right? The end of that fight's a little bit dirty. I'll agree that with the exact career that Fury has, Fury could easily have a loss or two. But let's be real here. 
Sonny Banks dropped Ali, didn't he? Henry Cooper <laughs> dropped Ali, didn't he? Rocky Marciano fought Roland Lestarza. The first fight, there are many people who believe Lestarza got robbed in that first fight. Right? Even the great Lou Duva, in an interview, said that, yeah, that fight, his favorite fighter ever, Rocky Marciano, may have lost it. Right? Tyson Fury has had some close calls. And, of course, the Wilder people, there are many. The referee, by the way, for that fight, Jack Reese, who believes that Wilder won many of the early rounds. Right? I disagree with the analysis, but let's just say Jack Reese did have a better view of that fight than I did. Right? Jack Reese, in the ring, felt that that fight was razor close. I understand there are many people out there who feel that that fight should have gone to Wilder. Right? Now, be that as it may, just understand, Tyson Fury right now is in rarefied air. He's an unbeaten champion who has had the lineal championship. Understand, Anthony Joshua has never had the lineal. Right? In my favorites folder, I have a video from Rummy's Corner. It's an excellent video where they go through the lineals. Right? Now, I'll agree. The line's been broken at times. But let me just say this. I do buy the argument that by the time of the Klitschko Fury fight, it was clear that Vladimir Klitschko was the lineal. Right? You can't trace it directly. I'll agree. There's a lot of subjectivity with it. Right? But understand, Vladimir Klitschko had fought unification fights. Right? The idea that Lennox Lewis retires, and that's the end of the lineal championship, really ignores what the lineal belt is all about. Right? So let me just say, several years post-Lewis, right? And understand... I personally feel that Vitaly Klitschko is a better heavyweight than Vladimir Klitschko. I know many in history disagree with me. But let's just say because Vladimir Klitschko goes out of his way to fight people like Rushlin Chagayev in unification matches, by the time he fights Tyson Fury, I believe we all understood that he was the heavyweight champion. Right? If you disagree, tell me about it in the comment section of this video. Right? Understand, the heavyweight division has had guys retire with the belt. Right? Gene Tunney. Joe Lewis. Right? Lewis, though, comes back. Lewis comes back. Lennox Lewis. Right? They have had guys retire with the belt. I'm not someone who believes in the no lineal championship, right? If Vladimir Klitschko is fighting unification matches and becomes the consensus heavyweight champion years after Lennox Lewis retires, I view him as the lineal. So then Tyson Fury beats him. As Rummy's Corner points out in that video, it's in my favorites folder here, right? Tyson Fury had problems that kept him from fighting. But that doesn't remove his lineal belt. Just like everyone in the late 40s, early 50s, even with Ezra Charles as heavyweight champ, everyone understood right, that Joe Lewis, when he left, was the lineal champion. So when Joe Lewis steps back in the ring, just like when Ali steps in the ring against Joe Frazier after himself being out of the sport for years. Everyone understands the lineal is back. Right? I'll agree. If Lennox Lewis decides to come back right now, there's going to be a group that's going to say, look, Lewis left with the belt. He's still the champ. This is kind of like how Bobby Fischer viewed chess when he left as chess's top-ranked Grandmaster. 
Well, just figure it out. Tyson Fury right now, rarefied air, historical opportunity. Right? I believe his win over Wilder in the third fight is a foregone conclusion if he comes in the ring healthy. Let me also say there's a Mike Tyson element here to Tyson Fury, who was named after Mike Tyson. Right? When Mike Tyson was fighting on a regular basis, he was good. Right? Guy stayed in the gym. He wasn't out and about getting himself in trouble, right? There are no fights with Mitch Green in Harlem after hours and stuff like that, right? Some guys need to fight on a regular basis. Roberto Duran, to avoid gaining weight, to avoid their demons, to avoid being out on the streets a bit too much, right? To avoid running into other heavyweight contenders uptown and then duking it out. The fact that Tyson Fury has lost weight, is in great shape, and doesn't have time right now to run the streets, the fact that he's fighting fights on a regular basis greatly helps him, right? Really helps him quite a bit. There's not that temptation to hit the pub, overdo it, right? Idle time isn't the friend of someone who is looking for regularity, right? So, Tyson Fury's at the top of his game right now, right? Look marvelous in that second fight against Wilder. If he beats Wilder and pivots and fights Anthony Joshua, and understand, it's the smaller men who give him bigger trouble, right? Usyk, in my opinion, is a tougher fight for him than Anthony Joshua, right? The Steve Cunningham fights the toughest fight he's had by his own admission. If he fights Joshua, who's just learning movement, who's not going to be able to move with him, who isn't as skilled a boxer in the pocket, if he fights Joshua, a guy who at home went 12 rounds against Joseph Parker and did not land, a meaningful right hand that entire fight. Understand, for a student of the game, for a student of the game like Fury, all he has to do is sit down with that tape. If you can fight Joshua, Joshua is two-handed. He does have a hellacious left hook. Right? Joshua can hit you also when you run in on him. Right? But if a Fury can take away Joshua's right hand, just like he took away Wilder's right hand, I believe the Joshua fight's an easy fight for him. Right? Let me also say, too, Joshua, according to reports, was down in sparring against Daniel Dubois. We saw him down against Dylan White. Right? You saw him down against Andy Ruiz. Now again, great fighters can hit the canvas, right? George Foreman is on the canvas against Ron Lyle. Go back and look at that fight, right? Championship fighters in big fights against real opponents, sometimes they're going to get hit and they're going to get dropped. No question about it. But just to understand, I believe there's an open question right now on Joshua's chin. He runs in the Andy Ruiz rematch, right? Wins the fight on his back foot. I applaud him, right? You don't have to be on your front foot to win a fight, right? I applaud the fact that Joshua changed his game so much from one fight to the next, right? Let's just say that worked against Andy Ruiz, who has below average foot speed. Tyson Fury has the best legs in the division, folks. Right? What happens if Fury comes inside and has Joshua's right hand neutralized? Because of his height, Fury's 6'9", he's able to stay away from Joshua's jab. Understand, Fury can be episodic. Right? What happens then? 
I'm telling you, the Alexander Povetkin fight, you need to overlook the scorecards, right? Look at these ridiculous scorecards in Deontay Wilder fights. Just revisit Deontay Wilder, Gerald Washington. I thought Washington's blanking him early in that fight. In fact, revisit the first Deontay Wilder, Luis Ortiz fight. Right? I didn't see how Wilder was winning any of those early rounds. Understand the only difference <laughs> between that fight and the second Luis Ortiz fight where people understand that at most Wilder won one round up until the knockout in the middle of the fight was public perception. Well, understand, Anthony Joshua, I want people to revisit the Alexander Povetkin fight. Right? Povetkin is winning those early rounds. I know that's not what the judges saw, and I understand the fight was in Joshua's backyard, and you had a crowd in love with a fighter. Joshua, at that point, was the box office champ of the heavyweight division. And I understand crowd noise may have influenced some judges. If that's the case, by the way, those judges shouldn't be judging high-level championship fights. Well, let's just say Joshua had a problem, and it was, in my opinion, severe with Alexander Povetkin's movement. I thought Povetkin was winning that fight when Povetkin gets caught coming in. Right? Understand, Povetkin comes in at different angles than Tyson Fury. Tyson Fury looking at that Povetkin film, could say to himself, okay, look, I'm not going to come in to throw hooks. I can come in and throw straight right hands and still be too far away from Joshua to get hit with the kind of short counter that changed that Povetkin fight. So you're looking at history. Let's enjoy 2020 right now. I'm just telling you, an argument can be made, and there have been some great performances, that Tyson Fury is the front runner right now for Fighter of the Year. If he beats Wilder in the rematch, pivots, and beats Joshua, and now might be the time to face Joshua. You don't want Joshua actually in the gym spending more time developing his back foot. Right? If Wilder beats... if. Fury beats Wilder and Joshua, and that's his calendar year 2020. No one else is going to have a claim to the fighter of the year status. Also, at that point, Fury could say, that's it, I've had enough. I'm the best of my generation. Who here could name the heavyweight who was better? If he walks away from the sport after beating Klitschko, Wilder, and Joshua when all three had the belts. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. I hope you leave your comments in the comment section of this video. I think Tyson Fury beats Wilder in their third fight. I'll be surprised if it's not by stoppage. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. Thanks for stopping by.